Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Everybody in the room, good afternoon to those watching uh, the simulcast uh, broadcast. Um, my name is William Ferguson, but before I get into my background, I'd just like to, I'm, I am one of the last presenters other than the other presenter uh, with Bells currently uh, presenting. But I'd like to thank all of the sponsors who represented this year for the Inspection Division's National Conference. And special thanks to Jim Speechiger to, uh, for putting this event together and working really hard. So, before I get into the company where I work today, um, I used to be in the military, uh, the United States Air Force, as a meteorologist, uh, not meteorologist, sorry, observer, forecaster, apprentice. And I was ha had the fortunate opportunity to get stationed in my first assignment in Florida, Patrick Air Force Base, in support of NASA operations. Wonderful. That's when I first got into data and systems and how they relate to each other in pulling information to make decisions. Um, later on down the road, after four years of service in the military, I started my own business for about a year and a half in the gaming industry. Uh, made a few bucks here and there, but I really wasn't ready to go into business for myself at that point in time. So I went ahead and decided to come back down to San Antonio, get some more skills, go back to school, and I ran into this company. At the time, they were, uh, they were uh, Kinetic Concepts. We're now owned by a private equity firm, uh, and the two business uh, units are Kinetic Concepts and Cystogenics. Um, I joined them in 2002. Kinetic Concepts does negative pressure wound therapy. It's basically a device that applies negative pressure wound therapy through a tube to a disposable device to help aid in the uh, closure of open wounds. Um, our other company, Cystogenics, supplies different uh, um, disposable products for the wound management uh, arena. So this here represents a product innovation uh, uh, release over time. And I joined the company in 2002. If you notice here, we launched our first NPWT uh, system back in 1994. And when I was hired on with the company, I started out in the NCMR area, which is the non-conforming material, where all of the rejected parts come from the line, incoming inspection, and whatnot. Didn't have any processes. Uh, we had processes in place. We didn't have really robust systems in place. And shortly thereafter, about a year, year and a half, they said take over final and incoming inspection. So I took on that opportunity and I was able uh, to have that opportunity to develop all systems in those areas, in CMAR, incoming and final. And I learned a lot through that process. And through time, as you can see here, the volumes of product just exploded. We had a patent on this device uh, to, to a certain point in time. And as you well know, when patents in then others come into the market to try and take over, right? We are the leader in the MPWT uh, market, and we have di differentiated our products over time. Through that time frame, I've held multiple positions with case uh, with, uh, sorry, Acelity, uh, the next position, quality systems metrics for all areas of the quality system, wherever I could help there in developing them. Then they moved me into Kappa, and project coordination. Had 12 years in quality assurance, 12, 13 years in quality assurance. And then I decided, let's go over to the IT uh, department. So now I work in ITQA uh, for the past three years and primarily responsible for software validation of our GXP systems, non-product software. All right. So brings me to my topic today, systems uh, development for effective inspection and test. Throughout that time frame, I remember I came to San Antonio to go to school. I was going to school full time, working full time through that time frame, and I was on a mission to get as many certifications as I possibly could. And it was primarily to become more marketable. But what I didn't realize at the time was I was getting a breadth of knowledge in multiple areas to help me get even better over time. Uh, through time with the company, they allowed me the opportunity to develop, validate, and implement uh, these same systems, inspection and test, in four different manufacturing facilities. Uh, 
uh, some global uh, and other outside the United States. All right, so my agenda for today is I'm going to go over our methodology for the development of incoming inspection metrics. This area is key because this is primarily where a lot of the data is, is generated and then it feeds out to the other uh, uh, systems that are uh, connected. Um, I'm going to talk about, as Rod and uh, Robert talked about earlier, metrics driven requirements around efficiency and effectiveness. That's where we start in developing requirements. I'm going to talk a little bit about those feeder systems for incoming inspection and the explanation and interac interactions with incoming inspection. Keep it high level, can't give all the secrets out, but I will uh, give what I can uh, today. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to develop the process requirements around it, uh, the most efficient way to do it, and then also talk a little bit about the regulator regulatory requirements in the medical device industry for these areas uh, for software development. Talk a little bit about managing the approved quality levels and risk and how the data will feed into quality engineering to help them make their decisions. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about cost-benefit analysis. Not every company out there has unlimited resources, right? So we have to sparse our data and pick and choose and prioritize those problems we want to go after. And then I'm going to talk about a few new technologies to, to, that are out there that companies are implementing today some technologies that we have implemented. So, going right into it, my methodology, if you see on the, the right hand side there, that's the SDLC process, the software development lifecycle process. And this area right here, requirements analysis, design development, I think is absolutely key. And when I was in CAPA, if you didn't get a problem statement right, then, you, then when you went to do your effectiveness check later on to see if that problem got corrected, you may or may not have seen a, a result that you were looking for. So in my experience, start asking yourself, what do you want to measure for effectiveness and efficiency? And then actually construct those graphs and charts because it will help you write those requirements so that IT can give you what you need and also give them examples. Generate those requirements, as I just stated. And then I'm going to go into generating the process and regulatory requirements, uh, utilizing process flowcharts, but give you a little twist on how to do it a little bit faster and better. And then I'm going to talk about uh, you know, developing the system and the procedures and then testing the functionality and going live ultimately. All right. Standard metrics, right, that are used at the high level for effectiveness. Um, in my industry, most, uh, most companies, unless they have larger volumes like the auto industry, uh, will use either percentity quantity accepted or percent, percent quantity rejected. Um, I prefer percent quantity accepted. It looks better on a graph when you're pushing it to management, 96% acceptance rate, maybe 4%. It just looks better in my opinion, but either or can be obtained. Then we have parts per million. It's sim simply the, the total quantity rejected, obviously uh, time, uh, sorry, divided by the total quantity accepted multiplied by a million, as most of you in the auto industry already know this. And then uh, another one, very low number of volume of parts. A percent shipments accepted could be also used, or the inverse percent shipments rejected. So, and it's a busy slide. I'm not going to go everything, uh, over everything here. The point is, all of these fields here, what I've learned through my implementations at uh, Celity, as well as my research in the American Society for Quality uh, Body of Knowledges, Knowledge, sorry, uh, every one of those fields are necessary to get that efficiency and effectiveness measure. Now, there are a few other fields that I'm going to talk about that are not necessarily related to that, but they affect either efficiency, the efficiency and effectiveness of, that, of those processes. So what I did was, to put this slideshow together, I put, the Excel, put those fields in Excel, and I, I put some uh, bogus data in there, and just to show you how you would come up with those requirements. A lot of folks, believe me, when I've implemented, 
have to come back around and say, I need this data, I need this chart, after they implement just the system itself. And it wastes additional time and, and money. So in this tar chart, it can be simply uh, seen. You can start seeing the trend, what's changed or improved. Note this is a cumulative number, all right? I've also noticed that, you know, you gotta cumulate, cumulate, cumulatively add this up over time to be really effective, not month to month. It doesn't work in the long run from a, a superb preventative action or corrective action to be put in place. All right. Um, then you drill down to the component level, may maybe, and look at the, the reject rate there. Now, is that enough information to help out? What has changed or improved? Maybe not necessarily. So you have to have that data in place to maybe drill down at a supplier level, comparing different suppliers. If you see on the left, supplier A issues starting to rise in the latter half of the year. And, in the, and on supplier B on the right-hand side, uh, they must have had a problem maybe on a first article inspection, you know, a first lot shipment. And then they've been improving over time. The point, point is, is to be able to break that data down to be able to help quality engineering and engineering make their decisions and even purchasing to source the, source the parts. I know this is a very high PPM because I just wanted to show this slide that you can take the same exact data that I input and calculate the PPM, obviously. If anybody has a PPM of about, you know, what is it, 400,000, I don't think they'd be uh, one, of the, one of your suppliers in the, in the auto industry. But the point is, you can overlay suppliers on your graphs and compare them and give these requirements to IT to make sure that you can drill down. <coughs> All right, let's go on to efficiency. Efficiency is essentially there monthly days to inspect. You have all these entries by the inspectors and you have to aggregate them and average them out. That's, that's pretty much done through the receipt date and the end inspection date. All right. It appears on this particular graph that things are getting better a little bit over time. Of course, you can do control charts on it too and feed it into engineering. Are we really getting better? Is this enough data points? So you can drill this down even further in looking at each inspector's entries and their averages. But does this give you all of the information you need? Not necessarily. But it appears right here that inspector D is doing three days on average and then we got inspector uh, B doing about four and a half. Why? All right? So then you drill it down and start looking into the total number of shipments maybe in, in, by inspector. But that's not necessarily always the case. You got, again, inspector D, he had, uh, or she had, a better average. Does it make sense? I said this guy had a better average, but this doesn't. He inspected more. Why? Well, is it significant? At this point in the game, you don't know why. All right. So, could it be that some inspectors have more complex inspections, right? And or not as many samples on average to inspect. So if you truly want to measure inspectors, it has to be a homogeneous uh, measurement where maybe you assign an inspector to the same type of uh, products throughout a month to see if there's training needed, possibly. It's usually always process issues that affects efficiency than anything else. Multivary studies can help. You can feed this data into Minitab and do multivary studies by inspector to see the differences between the inspectors. Some of the problems, uh, to, to uh, Michelle's point earlier on when she spoke about leadership, in my experience as a, as a young supervisor, I needed improvement in leadership. Went through a 360 feedback training program. That alone increased my efficiency in the number of a range of about 10%. Being a positive leader can impact your efficiency of inspections. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the feeder processes into incoming inspection. These are the main ones in my mind, and I'll go over each one of them individually and talk a little bit about their interaction with incoming inspection. IMTE, Inspection Measure Test Equipment, calibration, also known as. So 
from my experience, um, if the calibration ID is not entered on the actual inspection record and later on down the road when somebody comes to you and says, hey, that instrumentation was out of calibration, the, in my industry, the scope of what was inspected needs to be documented, right? So if you don't have that calibration ID integrated into the system, it's going to be costly to go and do all the queries and then look at every th single thing from X date to Y date that an inspector inspected. Every, just about every implementation or, or people that I network don't have that integration in place today. All right, so an example requirement, the system must be able to report what product was inspected by calibration ID. That includes the lot batch numbers for the components and the dates for the inspection. It's a simple requirement. System must also have to have that report that shows what finished goods users uh, where they entered components that were consumed on the line as well. The process, all uh, as I stated earlier, should have the calibration ID on the inspection record. It's not required, but if you want to be more efficient in your process, I highly suggest it. Also, um, when entering the, uh, if you do have it integrated and you have a drop down list for the calibration ID, you can prevent that calibration ID from even being used if it's out of cap. Or have an alert message pop up to the user that it's out of calibration and don't allow them to save the record. Okay, next area is non-conforming material. I love this area. Uh, very intricate process overall in CMARS, uh, feed into inventory, purchasing, incoming, it touches just about every area in the manufacturing facility. That's where all your rejects go. But inspection and testing operations, there's no need to inspect unless you can track and fix those problems. Metrics, the key here to segregate incoming inspections, simple stuff. You know, you have a field value for non-conformance source of incoming inspection. It allows the uh, supplier quality group to uh, segregate their issues and uh, working with suppliers, SCARs, et cetera, as opposed to engineering. That is if, it, if the nonconformance reason is a supplier reason. Okay. Another, another good integration, if your system is not, uh, ha doesn't have a, a fully integrated NCMAR system or it's not an enterprise system that has incoming uh, inspection and NCMAR together, um, integrate it or plan to feed it into an NCMAR record to reduce the inaccuracies of manual entries from the inspection record and it increases the efficiency of the process, reduces time to get it done. Both, in, both that incoming inspection average turn time that I talked about and also NC processing time. Mm -hmm. um, The system shall be able to integrate inspection entries that are rejected to the NC system. That's, a, that's the simple requirement. The other one there as well from the floor. All right, CAFA. I worked in this area. I know what they need and want. I, I, I was assigned well over 200 CAFAs with a team of engineers to work those CAFAs down. And we needed data from that area a lot. And in the incoming inspection area, uh, the metrics were mostly ad hoc in nature. Acceptance rates by component and things like that would feed into a failure investigation form. Um, always in, the, in, in that form, usually. However, the CAPA process really goes after the NC data associated with the causes of the rejections and in incoming inspections. No direct inter integrations with incoming inspections because you're looking at aggregate type data on the NCR side and or the incoming inspection side. So there's no real need to integrate to CAPA or makes any sense to integrate directly to CAPA. Maybe on, a, on, a, on an issuance of a CAPA, but it depends on your processes and systems in place of whether or not you have, it, have CAPAs down to that level of detail. That would be a lot of work. In my industry, CAPAs are well-documented and very thick documentation, so I would say uh, there's really no need for direct integrations in that area. 
Customer complaints. Um, again, these are most, most, uh, mostly ad hoc in nature, and they're usually in the form of acceptance failure rates that they want to ask for. They're, the reason, at the complaint level, they're looking at the finished device. So unless the complaint analyst knows that it's a component level issue, they generally won't ask for uh, information from us in incoming inspection. However, they do feed final inspection process. Um, they put different inspection criteria in place in the final inspection to make sure that that uh, issue may be prevented or it depends on where that issue is supplier or internal. Now, there is one exception to that rule. Some uh, companies, you know, mo a lot of companies actually out there today con do contract manufacturing and you'll receive OEM type product and you'll inspect it, that's when customer complaints will be interested in your area. But no direct integration because it's aggregating again. Okay, inspection criteria. This is our feedback loop from quality engineering and or engineering on what we need to inspect, the AQL samples, and it's modified based on risk and inspection history. Or sorry, re inspection rejection history. Um, again, there's no real planning for integrations other than the ICL by item here. Um, depends on whether you have an ICL module in, in, integrated within or you have a separate system it's simply connecting it by the part number, and that integration, so you can have a lot of different efficiencies gained there by essentially when the inspector enters that part number, brings up the ICL right there and then while they're doing the inspection, or maybe puts it on another screen. I don't, there's many different ways you can do it, but definitely through the part number. All right, Dr. Wayne spoke earlier about OC curves and LPPD, LTPD and AQL. And I asked him before his presentation that is sample size defective absolutely needed to, to understand where somebody is in their process for rejection to understand can we reduce the AQLs, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have sample size defective, and I've seen systems where they don't have that, that particular field, then you really can't come up with LTPD. It's basically, if you have a sample size of seven and you rejected two of the seven, that's the number. A lot of folks say seven reject, or sorry, the entire lot quantity rejected. So you're not really getting good inference information to help feed into QE or engineering. Also, um, if in the medical device industry, we have to document risk on all of our defects, right? And what I've found to be the most useful here is tie it to your DF and the A, PF and the A's, not more, more so your DF and the A's, could be your PF and the A's, but tie it to that, not integration per se, but the same fields that are used on those forms. Failure modes as well, failure modes as well. All right, final inspection. Uh, final inspection, um, I, lo I, love, I love this area because it's always intense as far as uh, the rejects. Those are the rejects from the line, right? Um, components would be failing from the line. And I asked uh, Dr. Wayne earlier too, do you add that to the, to the numbers that you have from incoming inspection? He said you can do it either or depending on which, which route you want to take. But of course, it has to be proceduralized and documented in, in the medical device industry. All right, from the final inspection uh, process there, I put this PDCA together, and this is a simple flow chart for tying some information to, to incoming inspection. So the first question you have here is, is it a supplier issue? If it is, you go the SCAR route, right? If it's not, potential kappa NC, all right? Most likely not a kappa for just a single reject. That would be deaths by kappa. So the question next is very key here. Can this issue be in, in inspected at incoming inspection? In some cases, uh, you may not have the capability to inspect the defect at incoming inspection. And let's just ask, ask this question. Let's say yes, then the inspection criteria is updated to try and catch it at incoming inspection before it gets to the line. 
and then you just do a PDCA on it and measure it aggregately over time. I'm going to, uh, an example for going the no route. Um, when we had aggregated uh, data to do cost benefit analysis for a problem, when I first came on board, and then the VAC product, we started manufacturing that too, uh, we had a lot of PCB rejects, uh, printed circuit boards from our bed business at the time, as well as the VAC business. So many PCBs were coming into the cage, singles here and here. It was hard to keep up with business for those rejects. So I decided to feed the data, the engineering, at an, not a product level, at an aggregate level, because I was seeing reject rates that were all over the place uh, in comparison to what was being consumed. And engineering came up with some ideas to come up with uh, ATE, automated testing equipment for these PCBs. It's one big old machine where they would plug each type of board in to test it functionally. As an incoming inspection, we only looked at uh, approved components on the PCB or soldering, was the soldering joints good, et cetera, et cetera. And they decided to go beyond that and prevent it even from getting to us. So they put the ATEs in selected supplier sites to have them functionally test it before they came. And of course, provide the report that came from the ATE to incoming inspection. And they would just verify that it was tested. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, it was in the millions and millions of rejection, scrap cost, rework cost, and I'll get into that a little bit later. It was a total success. And remember when I showed you this, uh, the, the charts about with the suppliers, right? And they went down the route of, of trying to reduce uh, the cost by single sourcing to a particular supplier that had the best quality and the best processes that supplier quality had audited to. All right. <coughs> So, which brings me to my next topic, uh, or my area of topic, supplier quality. This is the biggest area where it's our customer basically feeding data in, from incoming inspection into supplier quality. And in the auto industry, again, it's PPM. And in, the, in other industries or other companies, acceptance or failure rates. Um, the process, as I stated, primary method to, to measure. When I uh, was doing all of this, right, I was learning as I was going along. So when I came up with uh, the supplier quality report finally, they kept asking me for data and data and data. Well, I had to do my job at the same time. So if you don't get this right up front, you're always fetching data out of the system. And I see that in so many different places. Get your requirements up right up front right and your report re reporting requirements up front right, then you can go after the, the problems and spend your time solving problems and making a big difference. These are used, th there can be some uh, direct integration, but I'll get into that later. But the data comes from incoming inspection that will uh, trigger off potentially a scar for the supplier. They could also come around to us and maybe they don't think that the supplier has the capability of necessarily meeting it all the time, but we want to just verify that they have put in good corrective actions. So we might get fed a new ICL from supplier quality. Integrations, there's definite integrations here that could happen. Uh, if your system is in, in an ERP system, right? Your ERP uh, system has the data w with on-time delivery and the data from incoming inspection. These, those are the two primary sources of information for supplier quality. And if you can feed that into one single report from this area and pulling in the purchasing side data, that would free up a lot of time in supplier quality, as well as time in incoming inspection for providing the ad hoc reports they're asking for. All right, sticking along with the agenda, uh, process flowcharts, they're great tools. I usually use a SIPOC first to understand who the customers are as well, uh, sorry, supplier input, process output customers, right? But I also definitely use flowcharts to document system requirements for a particular process. You see the difference uh, before and after, right, on the left? The only difference is in color. I like to use color coding. The yellow uh, colors represent uh, physical processes, 
and the green represents system processes. It's a quick indication of where can I go look and analyze what I can do to make this, uh, make this automated or make it more efficient. And then you go pull the data around it too to measure and uh, to understand where you're at currently, getting a baseline. Regulatory requirements. Um, in the medical device industry, everybody has their regulatory requirements. I'm sure some of these are in your uh, industries as well. Audit trail is the who, the when, the what, or whenever a record changes. Um, very, very key. Uh, it's a part 11 requirement in, uh, in our uh, industry. Um, E-signature, um, when Rod and uh, Robert were talking earlier, whenever the FDA states thou shall uh, document and it sh says thou shall have a, an approval for it, uh, then if it's in a system, it requires to be uh, e-signature. Um, if you don't get those requirements, if you don't know your regulatory requirements up front too to translate to system requirements, you might get stuck with a hybrid, what, what I call a hybrid process where you're having wet signature documents along with system records. The, the idea is always to try and get away from hybrid situations, but you know, as you have an iterative process for the SDLC process, as I stated earlier, you might not always n get those in there because there's other projects in line that have higher priority and better cost benefit, especially in the IT world. Protection of records, um, simply uh, said, system must not allow a deletion of a record. Uh, there's security uh, procedures that are required to be put in place uh, for our protection on our server, all of our data. Um, and then you have lot batch traceability requirements. And uh, your higher risk uh, medical, device, uh, medical devices, lot batch uh, traceability is required when the product is inserted into the body, for example. Um, some companies are just doing lot batch traceability regardless in the of classification of the diet device because it helps them trace problems and, and, and segregate them down to the lot. All right, product X cost of quality. So when, if you remember that PCB problem I talked about earlier, you can pull the incoming inspections out. How much did it cost on average to um, process an inspection for the components for those products? I'm talking all components that go for that product line. So you aggregate uh, by product and, and put teams together and manage by product the process owner or the product owner. Final inspection costs, you, you tag a number to that as far as the number of inspections going through for final. Uh, rework costs, that's generally obtained from the ERP system. You're not going to have that in your NCMR system unless it's uh, integrated. Um, rework costs come from your rework jobs. Some components that cost money are on a rework job. You can't just take an average number. Some rework jobs cost a lot more than others. Scrap cost is simply in your ERP system too. It's a transaction showing that the, that the, the component was scrapped uh, out of the inventory. And then NC processing cost. Be besides rework and scrap, in, I'm sorry, Incoming and final and NC processing costs should, if you're the manager in the area, you should have those budget numbers and should, you should be able to come up with those numbers to process an NC. It's your NC administrator. That would have been my salary at the time, for example. Uh, and you take all the NCs and put my salary under there and multiply, uh, divide it out. All right, as an example. You can, you can add up all these costs in total and then aggregate them and submit them as projects when you come up with I when the Q QE group or the engineering or, or even the inspector gives ideas. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. All right? There's priorities, as you well know. If, if there's a higher dollar or health and safety issue, health and safety goes first, then your, dollar, your higher dollar uh, cost improvements are next. And you get on the list. So essentially it's being reactive um, or preventive. Uh, when you start looking across product lines and start aggregating and start benchmarking and looking at data where you can see things that 
um, have some kind of significance in, in having a, a relationship, uh, you can really make an impact on some cost savings information. The whole point, though, is you can't do all these presentations. You can't do those statistics and all those things without the right data. And if you can't get that data to them fast and accurate, then they're, they may be fetching the data or an analyst, and then you have more headcount that's required to get the job done. So, other customers. Other customers that care about efficiency, inventory control, they care, th their primary concern is once that, door, uh, once that component comes in the door, get through that process called throughput, all the way in through and out the process. So that if it's, a, if it's an inspection required part, they want it going fast. And then ultimately the manufacturing line obviously wants that part as quickly as possible and they want a quality part as well. Those are your two other customers. So some of the things that you can implement to increase efficiencies, of course, you can't implement skip lock without a procedure in place and without data to justify your decisions over time based on rejection history. And it must be documented. Uh, both efficiency and effectiveness. We've had a lot of vendors here uh, go over some of these uh, different uh, things you can uh, improve for efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, visual automatic inspection systems. Uh, these are where you have literature, labels, and you have a master copy uh, scan of the system, and you compare it against the parts coming in the door. Uh, the, the system does. Gets rid of the human error, and it can actually go through the entire, the, the entire literature a lot faster than the human eye, obviously. And you have you automated 3D scanners that can be utilized. Um, and then I really like this one a lot. Um, is, any, is anybody here uh, ERP system, SAP, or Oracle by chance in their operations? Used to be. SAP, uh, both SAP and Oracle, which are pretty big ERP systems, both have the ability to, to uh, have inspection-based uh, holds, right? Well, they don't, not out of the box, right? But they have the ability in the system to apply holds that don't allow product to go out on a sales order or go get issued onto a whip job. This is also good for implementation for smaller warehouses where you don't have enough space. And if your average day is, you know, three days, say an incoming inspection, you don't have, all, and then you have larger product coming in, you don't have that inventory space. So this process would allow you to store the goods elsewhere and they ain't going anywhere from a system standpoint. All right? It's a great way to do business and make things more efficient. But the only inefficiency there is you, the inspector may have to go out to the product itself to do the inspection. All right? I think I'm running a little bit early, about four minutes. But this uh, representation here is a uh, graphical representation of everything I've gone over here. I, I will tell you, if you don't start there, you're going to miss something. I guarantee it. I've done five plants. I guarantee it. All right? And, and as I stated, SDLC is iterative. IT gets all these big projects, and you know technology is changing very fast, right? Engineering, it's changing too as well, but IT I think is changing much faster than uh, technologies uh, around design, right? Now, for the next piece, process and regulatory requirements, again, use color coding in your flow charts. It works. And people say, I want to change that color green. I want to change that one green. Hold on, back off. But then they aggregate all their requirements together, all their cost savings information together, go get their sponsors to help them implement that, you know, uh, with their ideas, that is. You got you to compare it to the cost of the implementation to fix the problem against all this other pieces of cost. And again, look at multiple manufacturing facilities, too. All right, and then... 
you just do PDCA, PDCA over it, plan, do, check, act, over and over and over again with the data until the fruit just starts going away. And it did happen over time. The fruit was, when I first started uh, with Acelity, I had millions of dollars in the NC Mark cage. And I didn't have a process per se, a system, that is. Uh, I had an access database. And my inventory accuracy is quite a bit of million dollars off, right? Quarter million to be exact, about around that number. And I had to fix the inventory. Uh, the, the, the accounting uh, director didn't like me scrapping that, <laughs> scrapping that product, even though we didn't have that product over a course of three months. Uh, he called me into his office and said, hey, you know, you just put 100000 into my account. Now I have to explain it, right? So uh, later on, I had to slowly scrap it out of the system. But uh, again, the point is continuous improvement will ultimately, I guarantee it, save you or prevent you from spending additional money. Very important. This is key in every manufacturing facility, all those systems. So... I hope that my presentation today um, enlightened you, inspired you to go back and look at your uh, processes in these areas, your current metrics, and maybe start going around and doing those improvements. Uh, but do it with metrics. I guarantee it, it works. Any, I'll open the floor at this point in time. I'll thank you guys for uh, listening to the presentation. I'll open the floor to any questions. No questions? Discussions? No? Nope. You got a question, sir? I'm sorry. No? Thanks. I was just wondering uh, how many actual programs did you have to do or pro process improvements before you actually got uh, or more management buy-in or how, do, how did that work? Um, was it more like top-down driven or? Uh, w with what respect, sir? Uh, to e even getting the management buy-in on, on actually trying to do this stuff. You know, that, that trying to implement the systems like yeah, this? Yeah, that it's going to be cost benefit. You know, there's gonna that's be, a, that's or, a or, or like, did you have to do a couple and then they like, oh, wow, this is Great good. question, sir. Uh, when I came on board, uh, as I stated, they had an access database. Well, they weren't exactly compliant either, per se. So I had to get them compliant ASAP type thing. So regardless, though, they gave me some training in Oracle, and I took it on. I read a 300-page book on how to uh, utilize Oracle to configure the quality module to meet the needs uh, in incoming inspection final in NCMAR. I started with the NCMAR process. And I did it on my uh, off time, if you will. And I just configured the system. And they liked, I demonstrated the system. I showed how it would be more efficient. And they went with it at the time. We already had Oracle. You just had to turn the Oracle quality module on and work a few things out and get it done. And it was fortunate when I was much younger, um, I had a little bit of programming experience as my, my, my dad pushed me when I was younger. He said, you can listen to, lec listen to me lecture, or you can type up these computer, computer games, you know, the line of code, right? In the old Commodore 64 days, if you remember BIC-20, I uh, can't remember the name of it, but Commodore 128, 64. And he taught me how to troubleshoot and uh, debug a program. That base knowledge actually gave me the opportunity also to do that uh, when I came on board. But again, at that point in time, I didn't have my certifications in place. I didn't have the knowledge base that I had and the experience I have today. So you, you know that saying, if you know now what you knew then, right? Does that answer your question? Yes. It does. Mm -hmm. you have to prove it uh, yeah, I proved it for, to him first, but you know, if you have data, you can always take that data and wherever it is, you know, in it's, if it's Excel spreadsheet, whatever, and cost it out looking at those main costs, right? There may be other processing costs involved with the particular process you're dealing with, but overall, it, it, you gotta drive it with metrics, right? 
one other thought there myself. The the concept of the um, air proofing the records if if your calibration mm -hmm. uh, equipment isn't done, right? It won't accept the record, right? Those types of things, and then follow up to that that software that's making sure that it doesn't get accepted. Does that have to be validated with? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Everything I went over today has to be validated. But uh, most most of the time, your calibration systems are not part of an enterprise package of it, of most software uh, systems. It's not part of ERP either. They're usually standalone systems for calibration. It's normally always going to be an integration with calibration ID. And that could be used both in final inspection systems and, and incoming inspections. Good question. Is that it for questions, guys? All right. Well, thanks again for uh, attending my presentation. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it's useful to you.